What's up, everybody? Mac Dijewski here, back again with the Awesome O channel, and I am here today to talk some college football DFS. We are talking the Week 5 main slate. Before we get started, make sure to hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell so you know when this and all other content goes live at Awesome o. Today, we'll be bringing you behind the glass, as usual, taking a look at some of our opportunity data. We also have projections, ownership projections, everything you need to dominate. So make sure to check that out. But let's dive right into this and start with our first matchup. This is going to be a huge one in terms of real football. In terms of DFS, maybe a little bit less exciting. It is Arkansas taking on Georgia. 49 total overall, so leaves a little bit to be desired. 18 and a half point spread in favor of Georgia. Arkansas has been a darling so far this year. Even last week, you had KJ Jefferson at a pure value, and he's still below 6K. All that's been because of matchup. He was able to overcome Texas A&M some of the time on the ground with his legs. He has 210 rushing yards in the year. Sometimes over the top, burning defenses with his one number one wide receiver, Traylon Burks. But this is an even more difficult matchup for Jefferson. Very low implied team total at 15 points. Because of that, it's going to be hard to get to anybody in Arkansas. Even in this price range where Jefferson is, there's just better quarterbacks. And Jefferson has dealt with some efficiency issues, even though he's been very good. He's not even completing 60% of his passes. So he's a he's a pass for me. Overall, Traylon Smith, we saw him retake back his workload last week, which was nice. He had 17 carries. He's a bit of a smaller back. He will cede a little bit of work to Raheem Sanders, Dominic Johnson, but it's his backfield. Not as active in the past game as last year. Jefferson just does not throwing to running backs as much. He's still a tough sell because of the Georgia defense. The only player I'm interested in maybe is a one-off on runbacks to Georgia stacks, which I honestly won't be running a lot of is Traylon Burks. He is the wide receiver one. He is a 37% target share. They haven't been a huge pass heavy offense to begin the year either because they play with positive game scripts. So he doesn't even have 10 targets in a single game yet, but still averaging 92 receiving yards. Burks is the only guy of interest in. Devian Warren, Tyson Morris, Warren Thompson, these receivers that are rotating, no interest. On Georgia, JT Daniels appears to be getting a bit healthier. He's been succeeding through the air, and it's not going to be reflected in his stats. Only 185.7 passing yards per game. He's just been in and out of games because he's been hurt. He's not mobile, negative 15 yards, but stackable for sure. Arkansas is still a tough matchup, but Georgia is the A side of this game. They're approaching 34 points in implied team total, so he's still fine. I would rather get to other places at his price. The running backs, there's five of them they use. It'll mainly be four in competitive games, but Zamir White's probably the guy you'd want. No, no trust in him. Only averaging 9.5 opportunities. That's targets plus carries per game. The receivers are even a mess. They're getting a little bit healthier, which is good. We should see Dominic Laylock return at some point. I'm not sure when. Arian Smith's been banged up. Marcus Rosemey, Jack Saints banged up. They're getting back Darnell Washington, five-star tight end who battled a foot injury in camp. He's going to potentially play alongside Brock Bowers, and I would expect this team to do a lot of 12 personnel just because of the injuries at receiver. But Adonai Mitchell, Jermaine Burton, Kiaris Jackson, they're all just pure dart throws in this matchup. I, I would look maybe to a Burton or a Jackson, but probably not going to play much of this game at all because of the total. Game two. Same kind of game. Wisconsin taking on Michigan, a 43 and a half point total, so even lower. Wisconsin, they're receiving some money in the betting markets. They're minus one, minus one and a half, depending on where you look. Michigan just hasn't played anybody. They struggled a bit with Rutgers. They're passing at an extremely low rate, 26% of the time. Wisconsin's not much better, 42%. Wisconsin's playing a little faster than normal. That's mainly because of the Penn State game. Wisconsin's typically high 60s, low 70s in plays per game. So expect a very slow affair, defensive heavy affair. We haven't seen McNamara at all. He's only averaging 13 attempts per game. Wouldn't expect that to rise a ton. Certainly will if they're trailing, but I, I wouldn't expect to see 30 attempts for McNamara anytime soon. Not really mobile either. He's a top sell against a strong Wisconsin defense. In the run game, Blake Corum moved ahead of Hassan Haskins a little bit, 21 carries to 12 in their most recent game. Corum's just been way more efficient. 475 yards on the ground to 322 for Haskins. You're still not paying for Corum at this price in this matchup in a timeshare. I think they're GPP plays at best. In the receiving game, nobody is more than 10 targets. Nobody is averaging more than two and a half for a game. Again, that rises in negative game script, but Cornelius Johnson, probably your wide receiver one. From there, they'll rotate Dalen Baldwin, A.J. Henning, Mike St. still Roman Wilson. Tough to get to any of these guys, low volume passing attack and a rotation. Eric Hall is their tight end, but 
the only one player in the receiving game is above 100 yards in the year. Top sells across the board on Michigan. Wisconsin's not much better. They are favored. Graham Mertz is a worse quarterback for sure. He's arguably the worst on the slate. He's not mobile. He's not a good passer. He does have pretty decent volume, 32 attempts per game, but only 189 yards through the air. He's a pass. He's going to have to overcome his negative rushing ability with a 300-yard game, which does not appear to be in his repertoire. At the running back position, Ches Malusi, he's seen a fairly large workload. And even against Notre Dame, he only had 18 carries, but at the same time, no other running back handled more than four. So that is a situation where we can look to Malusi with an elite ceiling in certain matchups. We saw it against Penn State, 31 carries on the ground. He's being treated like Jonathan Taylor, even though the efficiency hasn't been there. Still averaging over 100 yards per game, 24.7 opportunities per game. He's still too cheap for his workload. Again, tough matchup, low total, but Malusi will be in play for GPPs. Wisconsin receivers get the same treatment as Michigan receivers. They've been more pass heavy because of negative game script, but really low efficiency from these guys. Danny Davis is your number one. He's only 4,400. So if you think Wisconsin goes down in this game, he does have 10 targets and eight targets in their two games where they trailed. Kendrick Pryor, he's been volatile. Three targets, five targets, and he jumps up for 14 against Notre Dame. Probably not getting to Pryor. Would rather play Davis. Jake Ferguson, the tight end, he'll be a guy they use in the red zone, but tough to target any Wisconsin receivers outside of GPPs. It's basically Malusi or bust for me in this game, maybe a GPP dart throw on like a Blake Corum. Game three, Tennessee taking on Missouri, much better total, 64 and a half. Missouri is a three-point favorite. Barn burner last week against Boston College, but another very up-tempo game. Josh Heupel's coaching Tennessee, so you're going to see a lot of plays, heavy pass right from them. Missouri. Very similar offense under, under Drinkwitz, who came over from App State, a little bit to my surprise. Either way, Hendon Hooker's been banged up. He has been practicing this week, so it appears he will get the start. He's outplayed Joe Milton to begin the year. 136 rushing yards in a limited sample. Not as much of a passer, but that's not going to matter. Under Hypo, they're going to see volume, which is all you can ask for. And plus, the rushing ability gives him a solid floor. In the running game... We finally saw Ty and Evans and Jamari Ball, Jabari Smalls play in the same game for the first time since week one after they both have missed a game. Ty and Evans has slowly worked just slightly ahead of Evans. He handled 11 carries to Evans' 11 carries pretty even. But then Evans, five targets through the air, and Jabari Smalls did not receive a target last week. So look, it appears Evans would get the slight edge here. They're, they're not close in price, especially on DraftKings. And in this potential matchup like Missouri's allowed 263 rushing yards per per game to FBS opponents Jabari Smalls is kind of this GPP target I like to take a stab on very good game environment two solid totals across the board both teams above 30 and Smalls at 4.4k and GPPs I'll certainly have him I will also have some Evans for that reason just high scoring game environment you want pieces of it in the receiving game Vellish Jones is their target leader he is also their leading receiver, 160 yards, but he's just played the third most among receivers. Their starting three are Cedric Tillman, Javante Payton, and Jalen Hyatt. Jalen Hyatt's missed some games because of injury, but he's back. He's running a route on a majority of the dropbacks. So take his target share for what it's worth. It is depressed. And then Tillman, he's actually been on the field the most on any receiver. He's just been very inefficient, 13 targets. He's only turned it into 78 yards. Those guys are cheap enough where I'm probably not going to spend a lot of time on Javante Payton or Vellis Jones. The targets aren't very different. It's a four-game sample, so the efficiency could change at any time. And Jones, Vellis Jones just isn't on the field a lot. Even with everybody hurt, Vellis Jones, he's still playing about a 40% snap share, and that varies week to week as well. He's a tough target. Willing to stack this team in contrarian options. Very cheap with Hooker and these pass catchers. Easy runbacks on the other side. Connor Basilek is averaging 300 passing yards per game. Not much mobility, 22 yards on the ground. But Missouri up-tempo pass heavy, 39 attempts per game. He'll be viable in GPPs, just hard to stack because Tyler Beatty has such a high target share, 16% for him, 176 yards. He's their second leading receiver. He's their second most targeted receiver, and he plays running back. He's handling an absurd 23 opportunities per game with most of that coming, not most, a, a decent amount of that coming through the air. 105 yards on the ground for him as well. He deserves to be the most expensive running back, and he should be very popular even at his price. In the receiving room, Kiki Chisholm's the true number, number one receiver, averaging 7.3 targets per game. Fairly inefficient, just 46 receiving yards. I think you can play him in runbacks or stacks with Basilic. Towski Dove and Chance Looper are the wide receiver two and three, but this team rotates a ton of receivers on the field. Dominic Lovett, Barrett Bannister, Mookie Cooper, they all see snaps. And as you can see, 
outside of Kiki Chisholm, nobody has a consistent target share other than Beatty, the running back. So really hard to stack Missouri. I would isolate Chisholm as a player you're looking at. Otherwise, probably just using Beatty and using some sort of skinny stack situation between Tennessee and Missouri here. Texas taking on TCU, 65 and a half total. Another fantastic one, five point spread in favor of the Longhorns. Casey Thompson's played well in the absence of Hudson Card. 80 rushing yards, so he's somewhat mobile. I think you can look to Thompson now, and we did last week. We were, we were trying to buy low on him while he was uncertain, uncertain as far as like talent goes. But I think he proved that he just does have upside, 300 yards against Texas Tech. Now he's appropriately priced. Certainly viable in stacks. TCU's fairly passive. They're also up-tempo, just like Texas. You definitely want pieces of this game. Bijan Robinson being more expensive than Beatty is kind of ridiculous. Bijan Robinson's very involved, but he's just not the same pass catcher Beatty is. Beatty nearly doubles his target share. Bijan Robinson's very efficient, so you can't fade him 145 yards through the air, averaging 109 on the ground, 19.5 opportunities per game. Outside with Beatty, he has a better floor overall because of the pass catching, but Robinson's certainly in play. Roshan Johnson and Keelan Brooks are going to be some sort of change of pace combination. In the receiving game, Jordan Whittington is their number one receiver. He's only averaging 61 yards per game, but 6.5 targets. He plays in the slot. That's a 28% target share. In competitive games, we've seen them go very pass heavy. So Whittington, I think, is the preferred stacking option. Xavier Worthy pops up for a big game. He has one more yard than Whittington on the year, but on five fewer targets. I'd rather play Whittington at a cheaper price. And Joshua Moore, it was leaked now this week that he's been battling an injury. So all this slander I said about Joshua Moore last week, probably a little premature. The guy's been hurt, and allegedly he's getting healthier. So I would expect more efficiency from him down the stretch. His route share jumped back up to 80%, which is positive. He's near the minimum, so really cheap stacking option with Thompson if you decide to go that route. On TCU, Max Dugan, he's been somewhat efficient. He's a good rusher, 110 yards on the ground so far, 239 through the air. Dugan has mainly been a dual threat we've targeted at cheap prices. He has over 500 rushing yards in back-to-back seasons. But this year, the rotation at receiver makes him really hard to stack. And he's expensive, so you want to stack him. He's not at that cheap price where we were taking him as a dual threat. It's basically Quinton Johnson, and everybody else plays a nasty rotation. And Johnson, the 26% target shares on 21 targets, they've been fairly run heavy, and they have been in some competitive games. So TCU overall, hard team to get to in the receivers. Like Tay Barber and J.D. Spielman were afterthoughts to begin the year. Now they're playing about 50% of the snaps. That takes Darius Davis, Savon Williams, Blair Conright off the field, even Quincy Brown's involved. So tough to get to any of these guys. I'd rather just take other players in different situations that are more secure. The most secure TCU player is Zach Evans, the former five-star running back. He's been playing in a timeshare his entire career until week three, where he has 22 carries. The next closest running back had four. And we saw a similar situation last week. Evans 15, Kendra Miller 5. Evans has been just so efficient. 110 yards on the ground per game, only 15.3 opportunities. But again, that has been extremely weighted towards the latter two games. And he did get involved in the past game last week. Three targets for Evans. It's nice to see him play that capacity. He's certainly playable at his price. Next game, Louisville taking on Wake Forest. Another 61.5 point total above 60, something we love. Six and a half point spread. It's moving to seven in favor of Wake Forest. Louisville, they've been efficient scoring the ball. Somewhat suspect on defense. They're allowing over 200 rushing yards per game, nearly 280 passing yards. They can score, so it just bodes well to shootout potential. Now, Wake Forest is strong defense overall. They played a week's late of competition, but Malik Cunningham, extremely expensive, but he's averaging a decent amount of yards on the ground. 263 overall and 247 through the air on 33 and a half attempts. Cunningham's in play. I think there's other options that are slightly cheaper that have a higher ceiling because he does most of this work with his legs. He's certainly someone you can target. Jalen Mitchell's their running back one. He just needs so much work to Cunningham that it's it's hard to play a running back in this situation. You can get to him. He's averaging 16.3 opportunities per game. He's somewhat active as a pass catcher, five targets for him. Mitchell's a middling play. At receiver, you never want to see this, but an injury to Braden Smith, who's going to be out for a significant period of time, that's going to narrow opportunity. And we struggled predicting the snaps for these receivers to begin the year. Marshawn Ford's been their leader. He's actually their tight end, leads the team in targets and receiving yards. Now we know Jordan Watkins and Justin Marshall are full-time players. They displayed that in the last game with Braden Smith going down. 
Their routes jumped. Justin Marshall, six targets. That was his, his season high. Jordan Watkins, his season high, eight targets. They're the wide receiver one and two. And you have Justin Marshall at an egregiously cheap price. The wide receiver three looks like it's going to be Josh Johnson. He was listed as the starter. Amari Huggins-Bruce is still the wide receiver two in terms of yards overall. But he's essentially been benched. I would not play Bruce. Josh Johnson looks like the superior play to him. On Wake Forest, another touchdown spread in their favor. They're very sensitive to game script overall. So they will throw when they're down or in competitive games. They just haven't needed to. They will be extremely fast. Sam Hartman has a lot of upside for that reason. He's not a zero on the ground, which is positive. And then in the games where they are competitive, you will see Hartman's pass attempts jump way up. He's a good GPP target overall. Solid stacking options, as we'll get to. In the run game, Christian Beal Smith is now in a three-way timeshare with Christian Turner and Justice Ellison. It's a pure three-way timeshare. And Beal Smith has been far more efficient than these players, but it doesn't look like this is going to change at any time. Beal Smith's a bit too expensive at his price point. He's averaging 14.3 opportunities per game. If you play Ches Malusi, you probably have a lot less efficiency, but Ches Malusi is ad- averaging 10 more opportunities per game than Beal Smith. Outside of tournaments, it's an easy decision for me. In the receiving game, Jockery Roberson, 28% target share. Better days are ahead. Game script's just been the animal to him right now. Can't really see the volume when they're just pounding the ball from, from leads. The wide receiver two is A.T. Perry. He's actually been more efficient than Roberson. Again, we have a huge sample of Roberson being an extremely efficient receiver. Now is a good time to buy low on him at 5,200. You likely don't see him this cheap again this season, I would argue. A.T. Perry being more expensive by this much is a joke. Roberson's the better play, price adjusted. Taylor Moran's pretty clearly the wide receiver three. He's been listed in the timeshare with Donald Stewart, but routes are drastically different. The targets have shifted. Out targeted him seven to three and four to three in the last two games. Morin's your cheap play if you're taking a stab at one of them. Love stacks in this game overall. The last three for that matter. USC taking on Colorado. I don't know what to make of this USC team. They've had a ton of trouble scoring. Red zone efficiency has been very difficult for this team. And there's only a 51 total. So this is a spot I think that's a little harder to get to. With that said, USC is the favorite. This spread is moving in their favor. Expect them to close around minus eight, minus nine. Jackson Dart's hurt, so Slovis has job security because of the injury. He's been way more efficient in his career, so we have a large sample of Slovis just being a gunslinger. If you want to target him, I'm fine with it in GPPs, but his season's been bad. You're just banking on he gets back to his old efficiency. Graham Harrell's been terrible for him. In the receiving room, Drake London is one of the most targeted receivers in the country. Not based on target share, 34%, but my goodness, he's averaging 14.3 targets per game. He is an immense projection. Even with the high price, Drake London needs to be considered. Wide receiver two is Taj Washington. He's averaging 6.5 targets per game. A little bit of a lower upside, but consistent option. Gary Bryant's the wide receiver three. He's emerged slowly throughout the year, mainly due to injuries. Kyle Ford's been banged up. Katie Nixon is an afterthought. So Bryant is somebody who has worked his way into the wide receiver three. He was on the field a little more than Washington last game, out-targeted him nine to three. I think both are fine at their price points. Washington's just extremely cheap. So if you're punting, prefer him. For Colorado, this team's a disaster. Brandon Lewis can't throw. He's not even averaging 100 yards per game. He's mobile, but even at this price, like he just doesn't have a ceiling. There's no way, even against USC, you take a stab on Lewis. Broussard is in a direct timeshare with Fontenot now, something we predicted at the beginning of the year. You don't play either of them against USC. In the receiving room, nobody has more than 45 yards on the year. So you just ignore Colorado unless you're playing huge GPPs. I wouldn't recommend it. Cincinnati taking on Notre Dame, probably a better real life game than a DFS game. It has a 51 total. Cincinnati, they're moving towards being about a field goal favorite. This is listed at one and a half. It's moved a little bit since then, around two, two and a half in most spots. Ritter, 7,500, cheapest price we've seen him in a while. They just haven't played any competitive games lately. And even going back to last year, their level of competition is suspect. He's only averaging 28 attempts per game, 250 yards, so extreme efficiency, 72 yards on the ground. Ritter's a great dual threat, even in this matchup, which is probably the toughest of the last two seasons. I know they played Georgia. Georgia's players all opted out of that game, so take away from it what you will. Ritter's in a tough spot here. Even even so, maybe he makes up for it just because he's going to play a full game. He's going to see more opportunities. For that reason, he's live in GPPs. 
easier to stack to his number one receiver Alec Pierce is 4300 his number two Michael Young is 3500 if you think this game shoots over the total Cincinnati is so easy to stack because of prices probably only stacking Ritter with one player because so much of his production comes in the ground but Pierce and Young are the top two options in the run game Jerome Ford has quietly been very solid with his opportunity He's 19 and 20 carries in back-to-back games, only three targets on the year, but Cincinnati hasn't really trailed whatsoever. So Ford, solid option for GPPs, 97.3 yards per game on the ground. I'm comfortable with him. On the Notre Dame side, Jack Cohn's been splitting reps with Drew Pine this week. He just got banged up in the game. It's a lower body injury, a foot injury, I believe. I would expect Cohn to play. If he does, he's not mobile whatsoever, so I don't think the injury affects him too much. You don't really like him too much for DFS with the low total the immense negative rushing yards and that shouldn't change it's an offensive line problem but he is averaging 32 attempts per game some of that depressed because he exited the wisconsin game i think he's a middling to low end quarterback play based on his non-mobile type style in the run game kyron williams reasserted himself as the bell cow out carried chris tyree 18 to 2 which is not something we'd seen earlier in the year it looked like it was going to be a direct timeshare kyron williams extremely active in the past game as well 12 targets already He's a solid play, maybe a little bit of an underwhelming one, but he's only 5K now. So I think you can get to Kyron pretty easily. You hope he gets there through the air. The run game has been extremely inefficient so far. In the receiving room, Michael Mayer is their target leader, 34. He's the receiving leader. He's the best mismatch that this Notre Dame team has, and this should be a consistent theme throughout the season. He's just too big for safeties, corners, too athletic for linebackers. Expect him to be heavily targeted. He's cost-adjusted here. The fact that he's less expensive than Kevin Austin is a bit surprising to me on both platforms. Austin's been fantastic, but he's not been as targeted as much. He is less receiving yards. I'm just playing Mayer at the price. From there, Avery Davis and Braden Lindsay are the two guys that you'd look to. Lindsay wasn't targeted in week one, but he has been very involved since then. He's actually out-targeted Lindsay by one. The receiving yards also favored Davis. That's where I would go for a punt play, probably not considering the really cheap guys on Notre Dame. The game of the week is Ole Miss taking on Alabama. This this spread is actually incorrect here, guys. It should say 14 and a half. I will get this adjusted on the back end here, so don't worry about that. It'll be fixed in the meantime. But 14 and a half point spread in favor of Alabama, an 80-point total overall. This is a spot where you have two fairly up-tempo teams, more so on the Ole Miss side. They are going to be balanced in terms of run-to-pass and competitive games. They just haven't been in any this year. Alabama skews pass-heavy. They're running about league average in place to slightly below average. On the Ole Miss side, Corral is still too cheap. And this speaks to a, like Cunningham being more expensive than him. There's just other players that should not be as expensive as they are when Corral's at 92. If you're paying up, I think it's Corral or bust. Very efficient rusher. He's 158 yards already, averaging 334 through the air. And they played in some games where they've taken the foot off the gas. So Corral should get there through volume. Also extremely efficient. Diced up this Alabama defense last year. The run game is a three-way timeshare between Ely, Parrish, and Connor. Ely should be the leader here. It's going to be tough to target any of these guys because of the timeshare against Alabama. But again, like they, Alabama allowed two players to get over 100 rushing yards last year in this game, and Ely was one of them. Snoop Connor, Henry Parrish. Parrish is more active in the pass game, which is why I would lean his direction. But these guys are pure GPP dart throws in this matchup. The receiving room... Really good targets here with Drummond at the top. He's been incredibly efficient, averaging nine targets per game, 115 yards. Mingo, he's averaging 8.3 targets per game, 101 yards. You can play either either of these guys with confidence. Braylon Sanders, the wide receiver, three, 4,800 if you're looking for a discount or you want a double stack corral. He's somebody you like too. Not as efficient, but he's clearly the wide receiver three here. And Jacor Pearson, when they go four wide, is somebody they'll put on the field. His routes have risen. The targets have not been there for Jacor Pearson, but he's the stone minimum. And this could be a product just of Ole Miss has been in games where they haven't needed to ride some of their studs. So maybe maybe Jacor Pearson's just on the field because of that. But his route rate jumped to 46% in their last game. John Reese Plumley's a gadget player if you want to look at him, but I would rather not. On Alabama, Bryce Young has not used his legs at all. He was supposed to be a dual threat, but negative 15 rushing yards for him on the year. He's getting there through the air, though. 281 passing yards so far, 31 attempts per game. That likely rises against Ole Miss. Like Bryce Young, but he should not be more expensive than Corral. And then Brian Robinson's coming back from an injury. He's handled most of the work when healthy, 
but that's priced in at 6,500. Again, more expensive than Belusi for 14 opportunities per game. He's going to have to hit the end zone three or four times if he's going to pay that off. However, it certainly can happen. In an 80 point total overall, you should be isolating this game. And we definitely want pieces at Alabama. I like getting to the receivers where you have John Mechie at 7,100. He's extremely affordable. He's the team's leading target getter, 29 to 22 for Jamison Williams, who has 300 yards nearly on the year receiving 299. He's somebody who's a little more expensive. I would rather play Mechie at the price. And then from there, they've just been rotating so many player personnel types. They use Cameron Latou in conjunction with Julio Billingsley quite a bit. Billingsley pops up for six, six targets in their last game. He's 3,600. You can use Billingsley. You can use Latou. I would rather play Billingsley at a cheaper price. Their true wide receiver three is Slade Bolden, who hasn't been targeted more than five times in a single game this year, 90 yards on the year. Bolden's typically a gadget player, and his routes run have been suspect. He participated in 68% against Florida, and then in their last game, they moved to more 12 personnel. So this is going to be scheme specific. For that reason, Bolden does have upside. He's worth a tournament flyer. And then JoJo Early also splits time. Wasn't targeted in the last game, but he did play. He's not banged up. He's somebody you can look to in GPPs as well. And I think you probably want to consider some of these Alabama cheap guys in tournament specifically. There's a chance they are some of the players that decide GPPs. But overall, I prefer the Ole Miss side because of the concentration. Oregon taking on Stanford, a somewhat moderate total, 58 points. Oregon's minus eight. It's moved up from minus seven. Oregon's been a ball control type offense. They're a little bit slower. They're very run heavy. That stems from Anthony Brown, their dual threat quarterback, who's more of a game manager when passing, but he already has 160 through rushing yards and he's been banged up throughout the season. So at 8K, I don't want him. He just doesn't have the requisite upside to get there in tournaments, in my opinion. This, this total is fairly low. And I mean, Stanford, their plays per game at 55, they were much, much more up tempo last year. Fairly pass heavy. Like last year, Stanford, they were such a different team. They ran 71 and a half plays per game. And I expect that to rise a lot. For Oregon, CJ Verdell and, and Travis Dye have been the one-two punch. Basically, it's been skewed Verdell's way. He has 22 more carries than Dye. He's expensive at 70, or excuse me, at 7K flat. That's not a price I want to pay for him, but he has been extremely efficient, 17.3 opportunities per game. We saw him break the slate against Ohio State in GPP. So Verdell, he's certainly live, and Stanford's allowing 212 rushing yards per game to opposing FBS opponents. So while the opportunity is not there, Verdell needs to be considered in tournaments. Die can be for the same reason, too. He had a 15-carry game, a 13-carry game. There is some upside there. In the receiving room, nobody has more than 16 targets. Nobody has more than 37 receiving yards per game. That's Johnny Johnson. He's the most consistent player. And from there, Oregon's been a complete disaster, rotating five wide receivers on the field. You're going to see Michael Pittman in the, the wide receiver two role, likely 64% of the 64% of the routes. Really tough to get to him. But like Chris Hudson, Jalen Red, Troy Franklin, Devin Williams, they've all played in a rotational role. Even Spencer Webb at tight end, splitting time with Terrence Ferguson. Really tough to get to Oregon already in a run-heavy offense. I'm not stacking this team. It'll be the running backs or bust. On Stanford, a team we expect to be much faster. They've been very pass-heavy over the years, a lot of the time because of negative game script. And I think that bodes well in this matchup for an Oregon defense that's allowed 340 yards to opposing FBS opponents. Take what you will. It's mainly Ohio State that they played that caused this huge number. But McKee, somewhat mobile, 57 yards on the ground, averaging 215 through the air. Splitting time with West to begin the year. McKee's job now, he should see more volume and potentially live in stacks. I would rather get elsewhere, but he's there. Their running backs are getting healthier. Austin Jones should be back. And it's a four-man timeshare when healthy. As underdogs, you probably don't want to target any of these guys at their prices. Pete and Jones, just too expensive when you have like Jalen Mitchell at 5,100. I'd rather split the backfield in a different spot, maybe even a Tennessee back. For receivers, Bryson Tremaine's the wide receiver one. He has 24 targets to Elijah Higgins, 21. It's it's pretty close, but we see that reflected in price. Higgins actually is the receiving yardage leader between the two. Both are fine plays. John Humphreys is the wide receiver three. He's only averaging 3.3 targets per game. And the tight end's Benjamin Eurosec. He missed their last game, but he's expected to return in this spot. Not really going to stack a lot of Stanford, just a low total overall. Next game, we go to Oklahoma taking on Kansas State. Kansas State pulled the upset off last year. It's only a 10.5 point spread in favor of Oklahoma. That's moving towards the Sooners low, 52.5 total. 
Rattler's played poorly, and just comparatively to last year, he still has actually been fairly efficient, but he has some turnovers. People are calling for Caleb Williams already. Still, like Rattler's completed 74% of his passes for 7.5 yards per attempt. It's not last year's numbers, but these are still fine. In certain games, Rattler does have upside. He should not be priced at 8,800. That's just name recognition and like Heisman talk to begin the year, number one draft talk. He hasn't played to his price, but if you want to take him in GPPs, the talent is there. The upside's there. We've seen it already. So you can play him in GPPs. You're probably stacking with Hazelwood. He's the only one with a consistent role right now. From there, like Mike Woods, Mario Williams, Austin Stogner, their tight end, Marvin Mims, Drake Stoops, all rotating roles. It's tough to see Mims. He is a he's leading the team in yardage, but he's barely like on the year, he's averaging 49% of the routes. In competitive games, he eclipses that, but not by much. And Nims is a really tough play right now. His price has come down if you want to throw a dart. Stogner's cheap at 3700 I mean, the rotation's nasty, and all of their games have been competitive except Western Carolina. So to see this rotation's disheartening, it's tough to target for DFS in a matchup against Kansas State, whose whole game is slowing opponents down, riding the run, creating long possessions, and keeping the ball away from opposing offenses. So Unless they just get there with efficiency, Oklahoma's a tough target. I will have stacks for sure, though, with that said, because the upside. Eric Gray's playing a lot more than Kennedy Brooks lately, and there's not really any reason for it. The efficiency's been actually in Brooks's direction, but even in their last game, like Gray handled 42 snaps to Brooks 23. If you're looking for the play that's more consistent, it's going to be Gray, but Brooks at 4,200. Like we've been playing this game with these timeshare backs all year. We want the upside. And now the prices keep falling, just they haven't performed. Still going to play some Brooks in the off chance that he scores the three touchdowns that Oklahoma scores. Just these teams that have high totals, you want to take stabs. So I will with Gray and Brooks. Kansas State's a disaster. Skylar Thompson's hurt. Will Howard's banged up, expected to play. But even when he's been healthy, they've, they've used Jaron Lewis. You can't play either signal caller. You can't play any of the receivers. None of them have more than 17 targets on the year. Nobody's averaging more than 42 yards through the air. Outside of GPPs, like, and this isn't even a good idea. You just can't play any receivers. Deuce Vaughn is actually their target leader. He has a 23% target share. He is averaging 99 rushing yards. He has 102 yards through the air, 22.8 opportunities per game. He's right on par with some of the other expensive backs. I'd rather play Beatty if you can find the salary, but Deuce Vaughn needs to be considered based on volume alone. Efficiency is likely not going to be there. It hasn't been there all year, but volume is made up for it. He's just an opportunity cost play right now. Would you rather play him or some of the other 7K, high 6K backs? I'd rather look elsewhere, but Vaughn certainly live in tournaments. He's the only K-State player worth talking about. Ohio State taking on Rutgers, a 58.5 point total. Ohio State is 15 point favorites here. They have not played with as much pace this year, partially due to inefficiency, but CJ Stroud is expected to be back. He's 8,300. For reference, I would rather play Stroud than Rattler, even though Stroud is coming off the injury. He's still cheaper, and he's averaging 321 pass yards per game. Just extreme upside. Easy to stack with Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave. Garrett Wilson, 391 yards, 255 for Olave. Target share is at 32% for Wilson, 25% for Olave. Those are your two options. Wilson's the better price adjusted play, but even Jackson Smith and Jigba has been a focal point in the offense. Had that 11 target game two weeks back, 283 yards. He has actually has more receiving yards than Olave because of some big plays. There's, those are the three receivers that play most of the time. Jeremy Rutgers, their tight end, just not targeted enough. In pure GPPs, he's cheap enough to get to, but I'd rather not. The running back room went back to a three way committee with Trevion Williams, Mayan Williams, or Trevion Henderson, excuse me, Mayan Williams, and Master Teague. In competitive games, it's basically going to go towards Henderson, but He's never going to be like the one back in the offense like we saw with Dobbins and some other guys in the past. Expect a timeshare, but enough efficiency here to take some stabs on the offense. Rutgers has been very good on defense, but they haven't faced an opponent like Ohio State yet. On the Rutgers side, probably avoiding this team. Noah Vidral, not a ton of upside here. He's mainly a dual threat, but he has 188 passing yards per game. That won't get it done against Ohio State. Pacheco's their main rusher. He's averaging 18 opportunities per game, but efficiency has been poor, just 65 rushing yards per game. Somewhat targeted out of the backfield, seven targets on the year for Pacheco, maybe in GPPs, but not a preferred play. Bo Melton, 4,900 is your preferred run back. He is a 31% target share, 8.8 targets per game. 
Aaron Crookshank runs out of the slot, really low A dot guy. He only has 104 yards receiving to Melton's 260. Probably not getting to anyone else. Shameen Jones rotates in as the wide receiver three. And that's about it for Rutgers, I think, here. Next game, we have this is a sorry, this is a holdover from last one. Texas Tech taking on West Virginia. Again, I will update this. That that game is just an accidental one I left on here from the the last week's slate of games. But Texas Tech taking on Western, excuse me. Yeah, excuse me, taking on West Virginia. Got myself uh, out of sorts there. But Texas Tech, West Virginia, 56 total. This game, it's an interesting one. Both of these teams typically are playing fairly fast. They are well below average in pace this year, both of them. It's a seven-point spread in favor of the Mountaineers. Texas Tech just lost their quarterback, Tyler Show, to a broken collarbone. Henry Columbia's played in the past, and he's been a very poor signal caller for the most part. But he played well in the last game coming from behind against Texas. He actually threw for 300 yards, but he never eclipsed 300 yards at any point before then, which is a, a big issue for Columbia as far as upside. But overall, I think you can look to him in – stacks and tournaments gpps that are large field just because he has that requisite upside you're kind of looking for with the pass heavy nature of texas tech hopefully their players per game rise taj brooks is out again he missed last week's game that lets sir roderick thompson who's only back from injury recently himself jump up as the carry leader 16 carries for him a lot of that in negative game script wildly inefficient on the day but he has upside we've seen him catch balls out of the backfield too Not targeted this year, but I think Sir Roderick Thompson's a decent target here if you're just looking for underdogs with some upside. He's only 4,600. Eric Azucanma is the preferred stacking option if you are playing Columbia. 34% target share, averaging over 100 receiving yards per game, nine targets per game overall. You're fine with Azucanma. Kalen Geiger is the wide receiver too. Saw him make a big play in their last game, but he's been far less targeted, only averaging 4.8 per game to Azucanma's nine. From there, they rotate the wide receiver three and tight end. Travis Koontz will play tight end when healthy. Miles Price runs the majority of the routes, but he'll split time with a lot of these players that are just rotational assets. I think if you're playing Price, you probably are just getting to somebody else. For West Virginia, Jarrett Deggy is not mobile whatsoever. Negative 46 rushing yards already on the year. He's only averaging 225. This is a situation where he needs to make up for his rushing production with like a 300 yard bonus. And he just hasn't been getting there this year. They are extremely pass heavy, but their plays per game have been depressed. So I'm not trying to get to Deggy much. Letty Brown is a true bell cow back 19.8 opportunities per game for him averaging 80 yards on the ground. They're now seven point favorites. You can play Letty Brown with confidence in the receiving game. Winston Wright is the target leader by one. He has less receiving yards than Bryce for Wheaton. Who's more of a downfield threat 219 for Wheaton 172 for Winston Wright. Sam James has been the wide receiver three, and he's actually the most expensive of the bunch. I'd rather just pay down for one of the other two guys, but it'll be close. They're all within four targets. And then Isaiah Esdell has outplayed Sean Ryan of late. His routes have jumped up, but still probably not trying to play either of these guys as uh, as your punts. But overall, that is the slate. We also have the FanDuel games, so I'll just show you a peek at these. We have the night games. We have the late night games. Everything you could possibly want for... DFS college football this weekend. Of course, if you like the video, hit the thumbs up button. Let me know your favorite play on the way out in the comment section. Otherwise, we'll be back with live before lock right before the games kick off. So don't miss that. I'm Matt Gajeski on Twitter at Matt underscore Gajeski. Thank you guys for watching and we will catch you again next time.